reach people for Jesus Christ. Now, when we talk about the stained glass barrier, Technically, in church growth terminology, this is called the E1 barrier. E1 is the building itself or that which stands for the building. Now, obviously, I am not against stained glass. I love it. But it's hard to see through stained glass, so that becomes a symbol word that you can't see in the church, so you don't go in the church, and people can't see into who we are and what we're doing, so they don't come in, and so that's an E1 barrier. Now, an E2 barrier is cultural and class. People of a different culture are a different class, such as upper class, middle class, lower class. Sometimes a second worship service might be an ethnic group, a Laotian congregation, Hispanic congregation, a Korean congregation, a Chinese congregation that could use your services in the afternoon. And uh, some people say, well, that's just like renting it to people who aren't a part of our church. No, that's like carrying out the Great Commission. Now, E3 is a linguistic barrier. The linguistic is a language barrier. In 1980, there were 200 Korean churches in the United States. Today, there's between four and 5,000 Korean language churches in the United States. Rather than everyone becoming more and more homogeneous in America, the melting pot, it's going the other way. And as a result, there are four to 5,000 language churches. Matter of fact, within sight of Disneyland in Anaheim, California, is the Yongnok Presbyterian Church, a Korean language church that will run six to 7,000 every Sunday in multiple services. The Yongnok Presbyterian Church in Seoul, Korea. I preached there one time at the 9 o'clock service. Now, they had services at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 1. Eight services. That's a lot of preaching. And I said to the pastor, uh, do you come back on Sunday night? He said, I said, what do you preach on Sunday? He said, I don't even come back on Sunday night. And then I said to the pastors I was talking with him, I said, how do you feel after preaching? that many times. And he said something to me, and I thought it was Korean. I said, would you translate that into English? He said, it is English. It was numb <laughs> after preaching eight times. But you have to think in terms of how many people he reached for Jesus Christ on a Sunday. After all, Sunday is your day. It's the Lord's day. It's the day you're called to attention, to reach people, and uh, that's not the day to rest. That's the day to work for pastors and staff and ushers, and let's do the work. Work, for the night is coming. Now, the number, let's go on to number four. To open a side door into the church. If you look into your notes, you'll see a picture of a church with a front door and a side door. Now, front door evangelism is called inviting evangelism. We invite people in. And it's called event evangelism. We have an event where we preach the gospel, inviting event. Now, this is front door evangelism, and you're going to bring people into the front door, but there's a side door. Side door evangelism is really reaching people for Christ. It's getting the unchurched into our church through winning a hearing. There are three steps in winning a hearing. A, you win them to church members. You win them to church members. You give your members an opportunity to bring their unchurched friends to church at a different time. And then B, you win them to the church. You win them to church members. You win them to the church with the view of number C, to winning them to Jesus Christ. You want to win them to Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about the side door, evangelism, bringing people into the church at other times. When we think in terms of reaching people for Christ, I want you to write a statement in your notes. The statement is this, the church of the future must be a cafeteria, not a plate lunch. I'll repeat that again. The church of the future must be a cafeteria, not a plate lunch. Now, a cafeteria 
is where you go and get what you want to. The key word there is choice. I happen to have gone to a cafeteria yesterday and got five vegetables. No meats, five vegetables. You go and you get your choice or it depends upon decision. The church of the future must be choice and decision. Now, if I had gone to the school once room, I would have gotten a plate lunch. I would have gotten what's good for me. Some dietitian will, by the way, with the word plate lunch, write down the word control, and with the word cafeteria, write down the word choice. Now, this plate lunch will control what's good for you. Meat that's protein, and leafy vegetables, and root vegetables, and your bread, and all of the things, you would have had a good, well-rounded diet. Now, in the past, the church said, worship at 11 o'clock. Study the Bible at 9.45. It's called Sunday school. We, um, we pray on Wednesday night. We do outreach on Tuesday night visitation. Men's fellowship on Friday night once a month called Men's Brotherhood. Women's missionary is on Tuesday afternoon. Evangelism in the fall and the spring, that was our crusade. In the summertime, it was children's evangelism called VBS. We had a well-rounded, balanced spiritual diet. The trouble is, the plate lunch in our schools is like the plate lunch in our churches. Most of our schools don't serve a plate lunch anymore. If you were to give a kid what they gave me, I went into school, and I looked down, I said, what's that yellow stuff? Turnips. Don't put any turnips on my plate. Put turnips on your plate. You have to eat them when you couldn't go to recess. What's that green stuff? That's turnips. One was the roots, one was the greens. And you know, what's that red stuff? Beets. They gave you stuff you didn't want and made you eat it or you couldn't go to recess. Today, if we did that to kids, we'd be sued <laughs> as a school. So kids today are spoiled, and they have nacho day and pizza day. They get what they want to. Now, the trouble is, in our public schools, the kids won't eat it, so they don't give it to them. In our churches, the people won't come. And so all of a sudden, the statement, the church of the future must be a cafeteria. We must serve people when they want to serve. And we must give people three things. Would you write three things under there? The option of time. So we're going to have a Saturday night service. The option of time, number two, the option of topics. Now, I'm getting into Sunday school. You've got to have more than one adult class so that you control that every person is in this adult class or this adult curriculum. You've got to give option of topics. And number three, options of systems of delivery. Now, the word systems of delivery, an another word is methods. I teach the pastor's Bible class. I have a large Bible class. But people say, Dr. Towns, I don't want to come to your Bible class. You just lecture. I have a lady one time who said, I like to talk. And she liked to talk. And she likes to go to a discussion class. And other people in my church like to go to a couple's class where they see a video and they watch a video. And another class goes where they have a lot of music and it's praise music and they have a praise band there. And so we have options. You say, well, I don't want to give people what they want. I do. I'd rather have them getting what they want in the house of God than not getting what they don't want and being home. So do you want to give them what they want and have them there? Or do you want to make them eat at your trough and they not come at all? The church of the future must be a what? Come on, class. Cafeteria. Not a plate lunch. Okay. Now, let's look at number five. The body grows by the division of cells. The body grows by the division of cells. Now, each worship service is a cell. Years ago, I met Dr. Paul Youngi Cho, pastor of the world's largest church. I went to his office, and we began to discuss Sunday school and the growth. And he was telling me why he didn't have Sunday school classes on Sunday. Dr. Towns, if I had Sunday school classes like your Baptist church, and you've got these three-story buildings, he said, I would have to build a city as big as, he used the phrase, 
UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, which is like five blocks by eight blocks, and they've got seven-story buildings, three-story buildings, six-story buildings. He said, At today I have 170,000 people in Sunday school. I'd have to have a Sunday school building five blocks by eight blocks just to get them in once a week, and then I wouldn't have any room to grow. He said, what am I going to do? He said to me, we Orientals understand the figures of the Bible sometimes better than you Anglos. And of course, Dr. Cho is Oriental Korean, and I am Anglo. And he went on to say to me, he said, let me tell you how to understand the Bible. You Anglos really understand the formulas, and I like to put everything into a formula. But he said, we Orientals look at the Bible as a metaphor. And he said, what is the number one picture of the church in the Bible? I had the right answer. I said, the body. He said, yes. And where does the body come from? He said, the semen, the seed of the man, touches the egg of the woman, and life begins. As the seed touches the egg, it forms a cell. And you look at that cell, and you can't see it with the naked eye. It is the smallest part of particle. And you, can't, you look at it through a microscope, and you look at that one cell. All that a man is to be is in that one cell. Then he looked at me and smiled. He said, if you could have looked at the first cell that made me, you would have seen a beautiful, lovely, olive-skinned man with lots of black hair. Then he said, if I could have seen the first cell that made you, Dr. Towns, I would have seen pale skin, bald-headed man, <laughs> and we laughed about that. But when you begin a church, it begins as a cell. Then he said to me, do you know something, Dr. Towns? If you try to grow a cell, that's a disease. Do you know what you call it when a cell grows? Cancer. The body grows by the division of cells. As you look at the one cell right in front of your eyes in the microscope, it becomes two. And as you look at the two, it becomes four. And four become eight, and 16, and 32, and 64, and 128. The body grows by the division of cells. Now, sometimes you think your church has to grow by getting the one auditorium class bigger the people in the church bigger. That's not the secret of growing a church. You want another cell to grow. Now, let's look at the diagram in our notes. The single cell church, notice in the upper left-hand corner, it has eight X's around the edge. This stands for eight people, but really, right in your notes, 87. The average American church has 87 members. That's probably a good national figure. Now, George Barner just recently said 102. But George Barner's figures are usually controlled by mainline denominations and not the total of all churches. Now, Sunday school, I would pretty much agree with George Barner. He says the average Sunday school has about 60. So if you look at that single cell and you say, this is a church. Let me tell you what the single cell church is. It's 87 people. Suppose I were to get 87 people and we were to stand around your church auditorium in one big circle like we're going to hold hands and sing, bless be the tie that binds on New Year's Eve. But instead of doing that, we get a thread and we run from every person to every person so that you're hanging on to 86 ends of the thread. This single cell church, everybody knows everybody. Everybody relates to everybody. Everybody waits on everybody before anyone will do anything. That's another word for a homogeneous unit, a like-minded, like-valued, like-purpose people. And the average church of 87 people is a cell. Now, notice at the bottom there is what is called a multi-cell church. How do you go from a single cell to a multi-cell? The body grows by the division of churches. Number six in your outline. To overcome the first danger level of 130 to 160 in attendance in church growth, go to another church service. Now, the average American Sunday school attendance 
is 30% under the average American worship service. The average American church service is about 30% more than Sunday school. Let's talk about the three churches. The small church, the upper limits of the small is 100. The upper limits of the medium is about 400. The upper limits of the large church is about 1,000. Now let's go back to that 100 level. When you've got a church of about 100, what do you need to do? Number seven in your outline. To move from or break the single cell church, there are four or five things you need to do. To move from or break the single cell. Most churches cannot go to a second church service. Let me start that again. Most churches cannot grow unless they go to a second worship service. It becomes a second cell to them. Now, to break that single cell, A, begin multiple worship services. When you begin multiple worship services, you will have two cells. Everybody won't know everyone. Everyone won't, everyone won't relate to everyone. Everyone won't wait. You'll have two cells, and you'll have a two-cell church. Now, step in B, go to multiple adult Bible classes. When you have multiple adult Bible classes, you are breaking that single cell mentality. Number C, add new ministries. The new ministry might be a new singles ministry that eventually will be a new church service. It might be a new bus ministry. It might be a new outreach to senior adults. Who knows what that means?